I would now like to introduce today's presenters. Nitish Mittal is a partner in the technology practice leading the firm's coverage of digital transformation and IT services in Europe and the United Kingdom and Ireland. He covers technology areas across artificial intelligence, automation, cloud, interactive services, and the Internet of Things. Sharang Sharma is a vice president, BPS of the Business Process Services team and assists clients on topics related to enterprise adoption benchmarking, optimizing business process service delivery models, go-to-market strategy, and market opportunity assessments. Nisha Krishan is a practice director and leads Everest Group Interactive Experience Services Research Practice. She leads markets conversations and engagements with IT service providers, design agencies, advertising firms, consultancies, and players in the MarTech ecosystem. And with that, I would like to turn things over to Nitish. Perfect. Uh, thank you, everyone, and thanks for joining. Uh, it promises to be an exciting and engaging webinar as we think about generative AI, everybody's favorite buzzword right now, but it's more specific applications to the arena of customer experience. Uh, and you know, with uh, my colleagues and I, hopefully we'll have an interesting dialogue as we go forward. So we'll talk about three things today. Uh, first, you know, we'll set the stage in terms of how we see generative AI. Everybody has their own definitions and so do we. So we'll try and you know, establish a common consensus on what the landscape looks like, what are the different components and so on. We'll then quickly dive into how we see the application of generative AI and related technologies specifically in customer experience and what are some of the leading use cases we are seeing clients adopt and also the potential going forward. And then we'll round up with talking about some of the challenges uh, that the ecosystem faces as we think about next steps and what are some of the mitigation strategies for those challenges. Uh, so with this, uh, we should be able to cover a lot of ground. And then uh, we have taken note of a bunch of questions that have come our way. And then we'll also spend some time in live Q&A. Uh, so Hopefully, we should be able to get, get to that in good time. Before we do that, we wanted to get a sense of the pulse of the audience today. Uh, so we have a poll question coming up. Uh, you'll have uh, about 45 seconds to answer this. And this is really to get a sense of how people are using generative AI. So have you used chat GPT or similar generative AI technologies specifically for your business need in the last three or four months, uh, you know, from being an integral part of your workday to living under a rock and the fact that you don't want to, we'd love your opinion. And, you know, while we people pull in, uh, Nisha, you know, let me ask you, you know, wh which category do you belong to? I think I'm squarely in a bucket too. I use it for specific tasks, but uh, wondering if you have an interesting story. No, I think for me, I use it for specific tasks itself. So I belong to bucket two as well. I generally use it when I want concise information on something and I do not want to go through 10 to 15 articles or Google pages. So it just concises information for me and that's where I lie at least. Sharon, what about you? Sharon, Sorry, I'm, I'm in a similar boat. Uh, I think uh, ChatGPT is replacing my use of Google in, in, in the work environment at least and it's doing a pretty fantastic jo job so far. So I'm happy with uh, with the use so far. Yep, and it seems like most of our audience agrees with you. Clearly, 46% of the significant audience today uses it for specific tasks. Uh, you know, uh, I still see, I wouldn't have bet on this, but the second most popular option seems to be that they're aware of it, but haven't used it. You know, almost 40% of our audience thinking that way. Uh, and then about 11%. Uh, vouching for the fact that it has become an integral part of their workday. So very interesting uh, findings as we do this. So, you know, clearly shows the range of results, but also adoption across that ecosystem. So, you know, uh, as we move on, you know, as I said, the first section, we really want to spend some time laying out the foundations, the market context, so that, you know, when we talk about some of the more specific elements later, uh, we are all on the same page. Uh, so with this, you know, what I'd like to do is I'd like to invite Sharang uh, to talk a little bit about how we see the building blocks of generative AI, how do we define it, or what's exciting about this space. Uh, so Sharang, what do you think? Yeah, so I think one of the uh, biggest misconceptions is when people uh, when people confuse uh, generative AI with ChatGPT alone. Yes, ChatGPT is a part of uh, generative AI, but uh, 
you know, generative AI has much more to it uh, just than the uh, chat GPT that Microsoft released. Uh, and, and, you know, just if, if you look at the definition, uh, it's, it's very sort of, uh, I won't say it's very difficult when, when we talk about generative AI, it's essentially a form of artificial intelligence that can generate context as in the name itself. So it can generate text, images, or other forms of media. And the other thing is that generative AI has been around for a, quite a while, right? Uh, while, while most of us think that it's only uh, come in, into picture recently, but uh, in fact, you'd be surprised to know that it's uh, it's been in development for almost uh, the last five decades. Where uh, the way we see it, we define three horizons for the journey of uh, uh, generative AI development. So the first uh, first horizon was uh, you know development up till 2014, and it started back somewhere in 1966, where early concepts around language translation, uh, the very first chatbots, uh, Lisa concepts around image recognition, uh, those sort of things were built. Uh, the next wave was, you know, uh, the last decade, uh, which started somewhere around 2014 and up till 2022, uh, where we saw development of uh, GNs, which are generative adversarial networks and transformer models. We saw conceptualizations of large language models by companies like Google. Uh, we saw text to image becoming a reality rather than something that, that's just conceptual. And finally, towards the end of 2022, we saw uh, the launch of GPT by OpenAI and Microsoft. Now, what we're calling as Horizon 3 is the current era. And we believe it is different from Horizon 2 because essentially a lot of activity is going around, a lot of excitement is going around uh, generative AI. Uh, already we're seeing a number of uh, you know, hyperscalers and other organizations investing extensively in generative AI, be it Microsoft integrating chat GPT in its search engine bank or even in its, in its office suite of products, uh, Google planning to add generative AI to its suite of applications. Uh, then on the other side of globe, we are seeing, you know, <clears throat> tech giants from China uh, planning to launch uh, generative AI related applications. And similarly, we are also seeing Amazon and Facebook showing an interest in generative AI. So what has been the key difference is that uh, with Horizon 3, uh, the key difference is that, you know, there have been some developments that have made it essentially possible uh, for this kind of exploded interest and development in this area. First is uh, the availability of faster computation. Uh, you know, for example, if you look at here, Google has that kind of 275 terabyte operations per second kind of capability, and I don't think other organizations are far behind either. We're also seeing that the work that went into generative AI and AI models in 2014 to 2022 period or the Horizon 2 period is now starting to show results. So for example, if we talk about GPT-4, uh, it's been trained on 175 billion parameters. And just to give you some context of how big that number is, uh, Microsoft's previous uh, natural, uh, natural language generation model was just trained on 17, around 17 billion parameters, so almost a jump of tenfold. That shows the kind of sophistication that GPT-4 has and the kind of effort that has gone behind it. Similarly, we've also seen that there's been a huge growth in the uh, availability of high quality training data and, and AI is as good as uh, the training data that's behind it. So all of this uh, in culmination of all of these factors, we expect that uh, starting from 2023 onwards, uh, you know, there's, there's gonna be a boom and, and like we call the summer of generative AI is here, uh, likely so because we're gonna see a lot of increased investments coming in this area and a lot of increased in uh, interest coming in from enterprises uh, and end users like you and me. So moving on, uh, here are some examples and I'll, I'll let uh, Nisha talk about these. So Nisha, sure. would you? Yeah, thanks, Sharon. So talking about generative AI, so Sharon talked about the fact that generative AI yes, is advancing quite quickly. And what is interesting for us to note over here is that the hype that is surrounding generative AI is quite different from the hype that was surrounding metaverse uh, till last year. And one of the fundamental differences lies in the fact that the economics and the technical requirements which are required for you to embark on your generative AI journey is frankly not as prohibitive as it was for metaverse. And that's the reason why the level of investments and the interest in generative AI has frankly been truly phenomenal. 
Now, when I talk about uh, the interest in generative AI, uh, there is a tendency to think about hyperscalers, the Amazons, the Googles, and the Microsofts of the world. And while that is true, as they are investing a lot in their LLM models, but what is also interesting for us to note through this slide is that there are a plethora of startups and a plethora of companies which are emerging in this space with some very interesting use cases. And that's what this slide is trying to showcase to you with respect to what are the use cases which generative AI is making possible now, and what are the kind of solutions that companies are bringing in the space. Now, let's talk about text first. Now, when, when we talk about text, uh, some of the text generating chatbots, especially chat GPT, which has been receiving a lot of attention, uh, comes into the mind. But there are a lot of companies which are helping organizations summarize, generate, and automate content for specific business use cases as well. So for example, Jasper is one company, which is a specific AI copywriter for teams as well. Now, it's not just text generation and uh, summarizing text where chat GPT or generative AI is playing an important role, but the area of audio where it is not just about translation of text to voice, but it is about being able to generate audio through textual prompts is also something that generative AI is now making possible and is now making possible at scale, which has, to, which has traditionally not been the case. The field of video has also opened up because not only is generative AI at this point in time helping marketers with respect to being able to edit content and be able to edit videos, but it is also helping marketers and advertising firms to generate videos and advertisements in a very automated manner. And that kind of is feeding beautifully into their marketing funnel. The, uh, the application of generative AI in image is something that I'm sure most of us are familiar with because it directly feeds into the content and the creative part of the ecosystem. And what it is doing is just through simple text prompts, it is helping you or any creative person or anybody using uh, generative AI for personal use to create very uh, original and powerful images. And that is kind of feeding into the creative uh, funnel of the marketing organization as well. There has been a lot of talk in the industry when it comes to the power of generative AI in uh, increasing productivity, specifically when it comes to uh, programmers. And one of the applications that we are increasingly seeing is there is a lot of interest in using solutions and applications that are helping developers enhance their productivity by code recommendations, in certain cases, some companies are also investing in solutions where code is being generated through simple text prompts. Uh, the uh, application of chat GPT, uh, chat GPT and generative AI specifically for chatbot is also very interesting. And with respect to that specifically in customer service is where it is helping a lot with respect to enhancing the productivity of the agents. And that's one of the use cases we will delve deeper into in the subsequent conversation. Uh, the other area where a lot of investments are happening is the search capability because what generative AI is doing, it is helping enterprises to make sense of knowledge that they hold within the organization and to be able to bring it together and generate insights within the organization. And that is finding a plethora of use cases and low hanging fruits for a lot of enterprises in the industry. The other interesting application that we are seeing is with respect to gaming, and that kind of becomes very interesting specifically for some of the design agencies which are specifically involved uh, and largely invested in this area, because what generative AI is doing is it is helping creators build lifelike characters, and it is also helping creators to convert any fictional story into a beautiful visual story which eventually is feeding into the gaming paradigm and the gaming story as well. Uh, one of the other interesting applications that we are seeing of uh, generative AI is also with respect to data, where it is helping organizations design, create, collect, and summarize data. Uh, not only that, it is helping organizations in synthetic data creation. It is helping a lot of organizations to be able to do data visualization in a very automated um, and end-to-end -end fashion. So as you can see from this slide, uh, there are a plethora of use cases. And as you 
put these use cases together, there are a lot of opportunities that get opened up for any enterprise who wants to embark on this journey or take a concerted efforts towards adopting generative AI. However, what is also important to remember is to see what are some of the low hanging fruits and what is something that you can do within the organization and what is something that becomes part of your long term strategy. So Sharan, why don't you uh, take us through uh, what is the art of the possible in terms of what we can do immediately and what seems to be a little bit in the future. Yeah, no, I think uh, you summarized beautifully the potential of uh, generative AI through the slide. Uh, but of course, if it were that simple, everybody would have just flipped a button and would have been using generative AI by now. Uh, that said, uh, we see multiple use cases for generative AI, like you said, uh, and then these can be cl clubbed across different generations. Now, what really are the factors that uh, define these generations or, or the ability to use generative AI are things like, first of all, data availability, uh, the ability to have a steady state of profit pool coming in from use of generative AI. And then of course, there are entry barriers around things like privacy concerns, regulations that individual industries have and, and whatnot. So taking all these things into consideration, we largely see <clears throat> three generations uh, of use cases based on the complexity. Uh, like I said, you know, the low hanging fruit uh, is things like personalization or content creation. And I think to that end, we're already seeing a good amount of use of, uh, you know, applications like chat GPT or uh, broader generative AI being used for these, uh, these ends. Uh, generation two, which is slightly more complex, is around using generative AI for things like customer service. Now, when I talk about customer service, I think you know it is stated as one of the most obvious use cases for uh, uh, chat GPT, LLMs, or generative AI for that matter, where it can take over a lot of transactional work that currently agents have to do. So answering simple queries around, let's say, your bank balance or requests around your credit card pin change, or changing your itinerary if you know you're a travel customer, uh, those kind of queries, and and to some extent even some of the slightly more complex queries, you know, where there's not just a simple intent of, hey, what's my account balance, but I need to do something around it as well. Okay, you know, my account balance. If my account balance is more than this, can you transfer X amount into my credit card? So those kind of complex queries also we see that Chat GPT or Generative AI has the potential to solve for, and and you know as as <clears throat> that use case expands around customer service. I think we can encompass the broader customer experience management as a whole. Now, what we see right now in the market is that a lot of enterprises are focusing extensively on customer experience as a differentiator. I think enterprises realize the importance of customer experience in you know, finding new customers, retaining the existing ones, and, and to that end, they're investing heavily uh, in, in customer experience. And, and with the pivot to digital, I think uh, generative AI fits perfectly uh, in, in that kind of problem where it can take over a lot of, uh, you know, work in customer experience, be it around, like I said, you know, answering simple queries, uh, helping customers in self-servicing, uh, even when uh, agents or customer care agents are involved, supporting them to help enable or deliver superior customer experience to their end clients. So generative AI can play a key role uh, in, in that as well and potentially redefine the entire customer experience space. Now, it is important to note that while this might seem like a death knell for customer experience management as a whole, uh, where some people fear that uh, generative AI might kill the entire industry, we don't really think that's gonna be the case. Like I said, uh, generative AI will be extensively leveraged to deliver even better experiences. And, and that's where we see the industry headed. Now, generation three is slightly more complex than the other two generations, uh, where we might see industry specific uh, use, casing, uh, use cases emerging for uh, generative AI. So two examples here we, that we have here are around legal GPT, which helps you know, create all your legal documents, uh, documents around compliances and all, uh, and, and it's gotten so good, uh, at least I was reading anecdotally that uh, the work that uh, GPT does uh, on, on creating that kind of legal documents is so flawless that it's it's hard to find errors. So, you know, as, as technology improves, as more data is fed, uh, we only expect that things will get better. 
and and similarly you know they, they're going to be use cases across individual or every industry so pharma gpt for example can help provide information around uh, medical drugs or even in in cases where uh, these are being uh, these can be used for trials of of new medicines so a lot of use cases and like again across other industries as well so for example in travel uh, you cannot just generate content but also help plan itineraries based on uh, individual budgets or or times of, of customers and similarly in other industries like media or telecom or banking and insurance where you can use gpt to identify cases of fraud uh, use that kind of advanced analytics capabilities that generative ai has to offer uh, to not just automate work but also make it more tight secure and, and, and a safer environment, both for the customers and the organizations. So a lot of potential across all, all these three generations. And, and I won't say that, you know, we're strictly in just generation one right now. I think we're seeing work and development across all the three generations. Uh, you're already, you can already find a plenty of examples for industry specific use cases or, uh, you know, generative way being used within customer care as well. Uh, I, I think it's just that uh, the first one has seen the highest adoption, but uh, over time, as as the technology matures, as 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 people get a better understanding of what the technology is capable of, uh, we'll see increased adoption across uh, you know some of the other use cases as well uh, for generative AI. With that, I think we can move on. Yep, and. Uh, Sharang, I see, you know, a bunch of questions coming in on the previous two slides. And, you know, I think as we start thinking about Horizon 3, Wave 3, we will see, you know, more industry specific use cases. So I think you mentioned legal GPT. I think I saw a question around how are, uh, how are legal departments dealing with IP protection? How do we think about, uh, you know, data privacy and other PHI, PII conversations? And we see, for instance, on IP in legal GPT, Yes, there's a lot of documentation and summarization that can be done, but when it comes to core IP, we see a lot of legal firms now in discussions with technology vendors either to license this or acquire technology, right? I think so there are emerging use cases that are coming in. Similarly, from a corporate liability perspective, we see new fields being developed, for instance, insurance uh, in the legal sector to help against corporate liability when it comes to usage of these technologies. So I think, you know, there's a, there are a set of things these technologies automate, but as is often the case, it creates new business models. And we're starting to see that with some of the more emerging use cases. And this slide expands on that a little bit. Again, you know, if you look at the, some of the building blocks or different technology segments that Nisha spoke about earlier, uh, we, we see a relative adoption differential there, right? So uh, a lot of the uh, adoption as can be understood is happening on visual media and text. Uh, you know, if you think of visual media, a lot of the stuff that you know, somebody like an Adobe and other creative companies are trying to do uh, can be integrated like with Firefly recently, which they announced with uh, Google. Uh, we've spoken about text and a lot of the content generation already. I think we'll see audio and speech uh, coding. I see a lot of questions around coding and uh, software development. I think that's an area where I wouldn't necessarily say it's a low hanging fruit, but I think there are emerging use cases around application development, improving uh, developer productivity but also things like quality assurance, right? How do you build test data models and so on? I think some of that can be uh, done easily. And then we'll have a branch of other more complex areas, synthetic data generation, overall productivity across knowledge graphs, compiling insights, where I think adoption is uh, in the moderate range right now, but we expect uh, a lot more to happen uh, over the coming uh, few months and years. So I think there's a it's, it's important to understand where you need to start with your generative AI journey, not all aspects of life and business will lend itself naturally to it. So it's important to know how do you start and where do you start and what can uh, provide more immediate, uh, more specific returns uh, in the beginning. Now, having said that, you know, we'd like to move on and, you know, uh, as you approach the midpoint of the discussion, do our second poll of today. Uh, there's going to be one more if anybody's keeping count. And this is more about, you know, how do we think about satisfaction uh, with generative AI? And, uh, you know, please ignore the typo in the poll that you see. So if you've used these technologies, uh, you know, could be any generative AI technology, chat GPT, BARD, other more specific private versions. How satisfied were you with the quality of the responses that you received? Uh, so Sharang, you know, based on how you've used this, you know, which bucket would you fall under, or do you are you satisfied? Do you think it could, could do more? Any uh, reactions? I think uh, the 
key thing to understand is that uh, with the current GPT 3.5 that uh, I think most of us have used uh, is the fact that uh, it provides what the correct answer would probably look like, right? Rather than providing this is the correct answer. And I think that's a nuance everyone wants and needs to understand. And, and once you keep that into consideration, I, I think uh, it, it can act as a really great assistant. So for example, in for me, it would be category two, where it proves to be a good assistant by enhancing my productivity. Of course, I don't uh, completely outsource my work to GPT because I understand there are limitations and, and I need to be on top of those. Uh, but yeah, I, I would definitely fall in, in the second category. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And seems like, you know, today is really where option two is where most people are gravitating towards. Again, 62% of our audience believes, you know, it's been a good assistant uh, by enhancing my productivity. And in some ways, if you think of the whole co-pilot framing that Microsoft and others are trying to take, uh, you know, you can understand why that's happening. In some ways, this is supposed to be somebody with you in your cockpit, helping you get better, not necessarily replace uh, what you're doing, which I think in the current form is, is really difficult. Although we do have a couple of people who believe that it can totally do their job most of the time. Uh, what's heartening for me to see is uh, nobody said that it delivered no value for me, which shows that, you know, we have come a long way. Uh, since the transformer paper that came out in 2017 and uh, you know the democratization of access to some of these technologies has really helped in uh, understanding the quality and how uh, this is happening now uh, with this you know what we'll do is we'd also like to offer our audiences today you know as they spend time with us today uh, you know access to a complimentary copy of our recently published report on generative ai uh, so you'll see a quick link pop up in the chat window if you just click on that link and register, you'll be able to get a full complimentary copy, even if you're not a client uh, of this analysis. Uh, and then, you know, we are happy to extend that further after you see this report. If, there is, if there's a specific problem statement that you're uh, thinking about in terms of generative AI, please feel free to share with us and we'll see our best on how we can help. I see already, you know, a bunch of questions, both in the chat and what was pre-submitted on this topic. Uh, I think we're close to 50 questions now. So obviously we can't take all of them today but we'll try our best to follow up. So we leave this open for another uh, five seconds, uh, but now I think it's a good time to segue into the next part of our conversation, which is gonna focus on, I think the really the meat of our conversation today, which is how do we apply generative AI in the arena of customer experience? I know we have three interesting topics uh, that we'd like to focus on. Obviously, if we had more time, we'd do more, but you know, these three are the top three use cases we believe can provide immediate outcomes, uh, quicker payback, and are already seeing some form of adoption in the end user ecosystem. So let's talk about that. So Shara, I'm gonna hand it over to you. You know, what are those three use cases and why do we believe, you know, they are the most interesting ones in the arena of customer experience? No, I think, uh, like you said, you know, the arena of customer experience in itself is, is really vast with different kinds of specializations that require their own unique set of, you know, expertise and capabilities, right? So on, on one hand, uh, when we talk about customer experience, there's largely the contact center operations, uh, which is a multi-billion dollar industry in itself. Uh, and, and therein, generative AI can be used for a number of things. Uh, of course, like, like we already mentioned, it can be used to promote self-serve, enable that kind of, uh, you know, uh, solving on problems on, on owned by the customers, but then there's another angle to it as well, but it can also help drive significant efficiencies and effectiveness in, in the operations. And to do that, uh, you know, you can use generative AI, let's say as an agent assist tool, where it can support the agent on providing things like what should be the next best prompt or the next best action that the agent needs to take based on uh, what the customer is asking based on their history. Uh, it can also identify areas where uh, agent can do with better training and then provide that kind of training environment to the agent where, you know, they can do that kind of one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one training uh, to improve their skills. Uh, using analytics, uh, it can help identify areas uh, of inefficiencies and improve the operations bound in areas like forecasting, uh, planning, and, and staffing. So a lot of use cases within contact center operations itself is, uh, for, for generative AI. Uh, next, when we move to content supply chain, which again is another big segment within customer experience. And uh, no surprises here, we've already seen that GPT is extensively being used for content creation. Uh, that's just one part of it though. Uh, I, I think uh, you know it can also help in areas such as content planning, uh, 
uh, scaling up because uh, what we see in a lot of cases is especially with smaller enterprises is that they struggle with the whole uh, phase around scaling up of content, which is so crucial to the success of their business. So I think GPT can really play a crucial role in that. Uh, localization, providing those kind of local nuances. Uh, that's another area where uh, generative AI can come in and play a key role. Uh, the other aspect is user experience design. Now, again, a lot of companies put such a great emphasis on uh, on the whole UX piece of it. Uh, you know, be it companies as large as Google or even you know small app de developers that have their apps on uh, iOS or Android. So everyone is emphasizing on user experience because uh, that's what is is the first link for customer experience between a company and, and a customer. And in that uh, that specific spectrum. Uh, generative AI can be used for either augmenting user research, understanding what customers want, what are their demands, uh, helping in design as well. So, you know, we're already seeing that uh, generative AI can take over a lot of design work without requiring that kind of IT or technical expertise. So you don't have to learn, uh, you know, extensive languages. You can just feed in what you're expecting, surely out of what you want, and then generative AI can uh, create something uh, that that can significantly accelerate the pace of your work in kind of uh, development, prototyping, and designing. So these are the three broad buckets across we, which we see use cases for generative AI. And, and Nisha, why don't you take us to the first one, which is the content supply chain? Uh, sure. Uh, so when it comes to content supply chain, I think as we talk today, for most of the CMOs in a multiple organizations, uh, content supply chain, which is the entire process of kind of producing and delivering content for personalization and for customer experience is really a pain because it's, be it's become like a messy web of disconnected workflows. It's become a messy uh, work, messy job of uh, disconnected MarTech solutions as well as disconnected teams. Now, with that in mind, the other thing that is also happened is that the content demand has doubled in the past two years. And that's largely because content feeds into the entire objective of personalization at scale. And as marketers are looking for more of one-on-one -on -one personalization and that too in real time and at scale, there is more demand for content in the marketing ecosystem. And as a result of that, not only has the demand for content doubled in the past two years, but in the next two years, it is expected to quadruple. So with, with this in mind, generative AI is feeding in the agenda of one-to-one -one personalization and also the content supply chain because it is really helping marketers across the entire content value chain. And when I say content value chain, it is helping marketers with content planning, which is generating ideas with respect to what kind of content should they be producing. And it also is, uh, sorry, if you could go to the slide here. Uh, for some strange reason, yeah. Uh, if you could move to slide number 12, please. 13. If only we had that GPT as a co-pilot today to make it easier. <laughs> sure. So I was talking about what role they are, uh, uh, generative AI is playing in content planning. Now, with respect to that, what it is helping marketers do is generate helping them generate ideas with respect to what kind of content should they be working on and uh, giving them ideas with respect to what kind of value proposition and what kind of messaging can be part of any kind of personalization at scale. I don't know, for some reason, the slides keep moving. Uh, we will stick to slide number 13 for this conversation. Till I move it, please. Sure, thank you. So, uh, so with respect to content planning, it is helping a lot in idea generation and it is helping marketers from the perspective of being able to remove creators block. The other area where uh, generative AI is playing a very important role, and I think Nitish and I also touched upon it in uh, the previous part of the presentation, is around content creation, wherein it is helping marketers to produce images, to produce videos, and to some extent produce audio as well, not just content from the perspective of sending it to all their customers, but understanding the customers, what kind of content would resonate with them. And at the same time, giving that content and powering the agenda of one-to-one -one personalization. 
it is not just content planning and creation, but the other interesting thing that generative AI has the potential to do, and some enterprises have already started having conversations around that, is content scaling. And when it comes to content scaling, there are aspects of personalizing the content when it comes to specific audiences. Let's say if you're designing content for Chinese market versus when you are uh, designing content for American market. So that kind of personalization from a visual perspective is what generative AI is enabling. The other thing that it is also doing interestingly is not just generate what kind of content, a certain kind of content, but what kind of content would resonate across different channels, which are increasingly becoming more and more complex. So generating iterative assets is something that uh, is becoming quite important for marketers when it comes to generative AI and optimizing the content as well. So it is not just about uh, optimizing the content from the perspective of the demographics that you are serving, but optimizing it from the perspective of language, from the perspective of regional preferences and world events, et cetera. Uh, there was one question that I saw on how uh, generative AI is powering uh, personalization at scale. I think there are two aspects of personalization at scale. One is the data aspect of it, which is building customer 360 and understanding the customers. I think that's where all the data solutions and CDPs, et cetera, comes into picture. The other aspect is being able to create content at scale for specific audiences. I think it's the latter part of personalization at scale where generative AI is, like, is already playing and likely to play a, even a more important role. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Now, uh, this is just an example, a real life example of how things happen. So for example, if you, if uh, one of the uh, persons in the media business wants to produce an advertisement or some kind of a content on the website, or let's say a toothpaste company that from a content planning perspective, they can simply use chat GPT or any of the other open source LLM models in order to for idea generation. So what kind of messaging should be there? What can be the ideas? What can be the value proposition? What kind of wordings can I highlight? And it kind of helps you remove the creator's block as well. The second part, you can use a solution such as stable diffusion or any of the other image generation solutions which are readily available in order to execute the idea that you got from step number one. So one of the ideas might resonate with you or you have certain ideas and you marry it to what you get as output as part of step number one and you embark on creating multiple versions um, and uh, content for that particular idea, make some own tweaks, etc. And that's where the content creation uh, happens through these multiple solutions. And content scaling from the perspective of now telling the same solution that you know this visual is likely to resonate with the customers. Let's customize it based on the fact that I'm, I'm uh, targeting a particular gender or a particular age group or a particular region. Now, as you look at this uh, value chain, it looks like we haven't really solved the problem because I started this conversation on content supply chain by saying that marketers biggest problem is this fragmented MarTech ecosystem and multiple workflows in the content supply chain. And here we are back to the same problem, multiple solutions and you know, uh, moving from one solution to the other depending on the value chain. However, as we speak today, what is happening in this space is the real power of generative AI in the content and creative space is going to happen when all of these solutions are embedded in the existing applications. And that's what Adobe in a way is also trying to do through its uh, content supply chain solution, wherein it is embedding all the capabilities pertaining to planning, creation, and scaling in their existing solutions through their Adobe uh, uh, sensory offering as well. Uh, moving on to the next slide, please. The other area where uh, generative AI is expected to play a very important role beyond uh, creatives and content is the entire life cycle of user experience. Now, as we all know, the life cycle of user experience really begins with user research, where you're kind of trying to understand the users, what will resonate with them, what kind of demographics, et cetera, you're serving. And that's where a lot of generative AI tools are currently either starting to help or there are specific research agencies which are working on building their own models so that they can predict how a particular user is going to behave in a particular solution, in a particular uh, context. And 
by using generative AI in user research, they are able to reduce the time it takes for you to do this entire uh, UI and UX value chain by understanding the user uh, much better in a much faster manner versus doing research right from the very beginning. So user research is one area where generative AI is likely to help. Um, the other area is the design part of it and the prototyping part of it. So think of it as the entire UI UX life cycle where generative AI is helping you not only create the UIs depending on the industry that you are serving or a particular website that you might be building. So from the perspective of idea generation, but there are specific solutions which are helping you build prototypes of a particular website within a matter of uh, 10 seconds. And uh, that is not something that you would be presenting to your client. So that might immediately serve your needs, but it will be helpful from the perspective of helping the person who is developing this solution to come up with a few ideas and make iterations. So user research, design, and prototyping are some of the UX areas where generative AI is expected to play a greater role. Um, the development and the testing part of it we spoke about. So from a development perspective, enhancing developers' pr productivity. From a testing perspective, being able to help with test data generation and being able to reduce the manual effort when it comes to UX performance is something that generative AI is expected to play a greater role as well. Uh, we'll now move on to the next one where we will talk about uh, customer service. Uh, Sharan, why don't you take us through it? Sharan, happy to. Uh, again, I've already touched upon some of these themes in uh, the earlier slides as well. But again, uh, when we talk about contact centers, I, I think this is an area that's close to my heart. Uh, we expect that uh, generative AI will be deployed across multiple use cases. So, like I said already, you know, uh, we've already seen uh, AI, uh, which in the past we've called as conversational AI, being used to handle transactional work. But the gap with conversational AI was that when when uh, the queries got slightly complex or if there were multiple intents or us from the customers, uh, the AI solution simply struggled with providing an answer and, and that frustrated a lot of customers. But with the generative AI, uh, you know, it, it takes the whole uh, complexity equation to a next level. And we've already seen examples of generative AI being able to solve even mid or high complexity problems with multiple intents uh, and at ease. Uh, so the other thing that works really well in generative AI's favor is that when you're having a conversation with generative AI, it feels very human-like. I mean, you don't feel like you're talking talking to a robot, which I raise a lot of customers. Uh, so if if you're solving for that problem, you're solving for, you know, uh, for 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 the use of generative AI in, in contact centers. And in fact, uh, we have already seen uh, some studies around it. So for example, uh, I was reading this research that MIT recently released where uh, generative AI was used in a call center that was around 500 odd seater. And it was being used as a tool for providing agents with guidance uh, for, for answering some of the more simple queries. And the impact in, in the very short term was that uh, there was a net productivity uh, gain of 14%, which is huge uh, if you look at the absolute numbers. And as the, the solution develops in the future, we expect that the impact will increase further down the line. Uh, the next one is, like I said, agent productivity enhancement. So things like agent prompts, where what should the customer say to a customer? Uh, what should the agent say to customers? Query, uh, providing real-time guidance and coaching, uh, providing transcription of the call, uh, also allowing agents to handle multiple conversations at once. So in the past, we've always uh, said that with the digital intervention and contact center, it's a uh, a technology assisted human led delivery but with generative ai we feel like you know over time there's a potential for uh, a human assisted technology led delivery where agents will only be participating where and when needed for very complex cases but most of the work uh, will be done by a generative ai and and this will allow like like i mentioned for agents to handle multiple or oversee multiple conversations at once uh, which will greatly enhance the overall efficiency and productivity of the con uh, contact center now, the other use case that we see is around easy implementation of new capabilities. Uh, given that how easy it is to implement new features with generative AI without requiring, you know, IT background or having to code a lot for these changes. 
Uh, this can allow contact center administrators to implement either new features, make additions, or even real time changes without you know having an IT guy say, sit in the background and, and asking them to uh, do all of that. Now, some of the areas of application where this can be advantageous includes things like real time analytics, we've already mentioned, uh, easy report generation and customization. So, if, if you want to test uh, some insights with different parameters or on a different time scale, you can quickly do that without you know, requiring uh, a deep expertise of that analytics tool. It can significantly also help in IVR and dialogue flow customization and design where you don't have to feed in you know, individual responses for uh, even when you're talking to an IVR or a conversational AI solution, but these can be auto-generated as well. And finally, improved call routing, uh, which can help in making sure that uh, the right queries get assigned to the right agents, which can significantly help in enhancing the agent's ability to solve for them in the first call. And, and finally, like I said, you know, enhanced analytics where uh, generative AI can sit on top of your existing analytics solution and, and provide a whole level of customization insights that was simply not possible before. Now, the impact of all of these, we expect that on, on the key SLEs and KPIs that are or key performance matrix that are typically used in contact centers is going to be direct. On one hand, we expect that things like containment rate, first call resolution rate, uh, agent productivity, uh, the employee satisfaction or the customer satisfaction, these are going to go significantly up because of the use of technology. And then on the other hand, uh, we'll see things like average handle time, which is the amount of time it takes for an agent to resolve a call or the attrition rate of agents uh, that will significantly go down as agents are also, or agents will also find themselves in an environment where, you know, they're getting to learn uh, their productivity is enhancing and then not uh, being tasked with repetitive work. So all of this will result in, in a contact center, which is more efficient, which keeps customer experience at the top, uh, where you know costs are coming down because of use of technology and, and the customer experience is being enhanced greatly. So I, I think with that, uh, we discussed the three use cases for uh, generative AI and customer experience. And, and with that, I think we can go to the next poll and the final poll that we have for this webinar. Uh, we just wanted to understand based on your experience, based on your opinion, uh, where do you see the benefit of generative AI being, uh, you know, the most significant across three areas that we just described, that is content supply chain, user experience design, uh, and contact center operations. And, and I know, uh, you know, the responses will be slightly biased based on which areas that, that you specifically work on, but uh, still, and I'm just checking Nitesh, uh, Nisha, if you have any opinions here. As, as, as our viewers type in their responses. I am biased towards user experience design, Sharang, if you ask me. But that's well, it. So this is not following the number two rule. <laughs> Clearly, I, I mean, uh, there's, there's, okay, I, I'd say contact center is slightly ahead, but I think, uh, you know, the other two are not that far behind. Uh, which shows that the applicability of generative AI is far and wide and, and not just limited to either one area or one use case, which again is, is a great thing in my opinion. With that, I think we can move and, and I think it's also important while so far there's been a lot of excitement, there's a lot, lot of buzz and everyone's been painting a very rosy picture around generative AI and how it will revolutionize the whole customer experience industry. But also it's important to understand what the current challenges are and how they can be best addressed. So we'll uh, dive into that in, in the current section. Uh, and just do you want to walk us through this? Sure. Yep. So I think we'll uh, focus on challenges and what we'll do is maybe we'll spend a couple of minutes, uh, you know, just looking at the time. We want to spend some time on Q&A. So Nisha, maybe we can talk a little bit about challenges. I know we've got a lot of questions around how do we trust these outcomes? How do we think about training data? How do we think about data privacy? I think we have spoken a little bit about legal and ethical questions already. So, you know, these are all the questions that we're seeing around this from training data, legality and ethics. How do you integrate this with systems? I think there's a big talent gap around generative AI and, and the cost as well. So Nisha, if we move on, do we also want to talk about how do we circumvent this? I think there are enough problems out there. You know, how are we seeing some of those workarounds? as you move to the next slide, you know, for these issues and what's being done already? 
Sure. Yeah, so as Nitesh spoke that there are quite a few challenges, but then industry is coming together to address some of those challenges. So for example, organizations such as Adobe are trying to address the challenge pertaining to plagiarism and the fact that you know the AI models are being trained on uh, publicly available data and hence does not comply to GDPR. So there are plagiarism checkers that are being developed by certain companies, specifically uh, the solution that Adobe is working on. Uh, the, the, their models are being trained on data that they completely own or have copyright on or data that is publicly available and there is consent to use it for any particular use case. So that is one thing that we are seeing in the industry. The other challenge is the compensation structure for creatives where companies such as Adobe and Salesforce are also creating a compensation structure for creatives so that if there are any issues pertaining to the copyright of the images or the content that they are generated, they are being fairly compensated. It is still work in progress, but the industry acknowledges the challenges and are working towards it. With respect to the scale gap in generative AI, interestingly, I have been participating in a lot of conversations where there is a lot of forward thinking happening with respect to A, AI academies within enterprises and a lot of other companies uh, so that they can train their existing workforce and B, there are conversations happening with the educations, educational institutions and with some of the governments as well in terms of how do we really address the skill gap, not when they join the workforce, but how do we currently prepare uh, the future workforce to work in, a, in an area where generative AI will truly be democratized. Um, the other area that we are thinking, uh, the other area that we are seeing is training uh, the models with customized data. Interestingly, a lot of uh, companies, especially in the healthcare sector and in the financial services sector, are not comfortable at all to uh, share uh, data with respect to the existing LLM models. So either they are developing their own models, which is a costly affair, or in certain cases, they are partnering with system integrators, which are developing solutions and accelerators to either mask the data or to not expose the data to the LLM model. So that's where the, some of the issues around privacy are being addressed and some of the forward looking things, for example, Google talking about fair representation learning model where data biases, et cetera, are also getting removed is something that's too early in the game. And, uh, but, but this is something that the industry is actively work, working towards. Sustainability is an interesting question because I was talking to somebody uh, recently and sustainability becoming such an important topic uh, it was. It, it's widely quoted that just for training one uh, LLM model, uh, there is an emission of about 315 tons of carbon dioxide. And that is concerning because we are increasingly living in a world where consumers are making choices about what they use and consume based on how sustainable a particular enterprise is. And when you marry that narrative to generative AI being of unsustainable technology from the perspective of carbon emissions, then it becomes a concern. And one of the things that we are also seeing in the industry is that some of these hyperscalers are working on, uh, uh, you know, chips and uh, computing power chips that are not that energy hungry when it comes to computation, and be more and more reliance on cleaner energy sources and making a lot of investments towards their own sustainability goals and renewable. Uh, sources of energy, something that we are seeing a lot of movement in as well. So yeah, those are some of the things that I wanted to highlight uh, from the perspective of how some of the challenges are being addressed. There is some other movement that is happening in the industry with respect to private LLMs, with respect to private information detection in some of these AI models as well. Uh, so that's about it from a challenges and mitigation perspective. Happy to answer some of the questions now. Yeah, I think uh, we'll try and take a few questions. I think when you receive the slide back, there's another slide which talks about how we think this will evolve as you go to the next page, but we'll kind of use this as a placeholder. Uh, you know, we've spoken a lot about this already, right? From how do you understand the potential of this technology? Don't let perfection be the enemy of code. Start somewhere. That leads you to identifying the right use cases, analyzing the potential impact on what you're trying to do, as we saw earlier. Think about the relevant capabilities. I saw some questions around what skill sets do we need? Do we need inference interpreters? Do we need prompt skills to be able to create the right question, not just the answer? And then how do you think about ongoing governance? So with this, what we'll do is, and you'll have a bunch more resources in the slide deck around our existing research around this, and you can reach out to any of us 
for our teams and we are more than happy uh, to talk. So with this, let me try and try do 50 questions in four minutes. No, I don't think I'll do that. I think I'll, I'll try put these questions in chat GPT and see and unbarred maybe given it's at least connected to the internet. But let me start with one and then I have one for you around user experience and design. Let's see if we can do more. So I think there was a question around how is generative AI being adopted in financial services? I think I saw a couple of questions uh, both today and in the one submitted earlier. I think we see three or four specific use cases. One I think is fraud detection. So how do you think you, know, you can uh, maybe create synthetic data to, uh, you know, similar to real world data, but also use that to train machine learning models to detect fraud. I think we're starting to see work around risk assessment. So again, la large amounts of data being analyzed to identify patterns and trends and make better decision and lending and investing invest uh, decisions. Customer service, you know, Sharon spoke about it, right? So right from chatbots, but also, you know, making agents uh, more productive. So reduce things like AHT or agent handling time. And then wealth management is an interesting use case where how do you create personalized investment plans based on the right prompts? You know, I think we saw JP Morgan recently patenting, uh, you know, the term index GPT. So their own robot advisor on steroids, perhaps. So I think those are the use cases we'll see in financial services. Still early stages, but I think lots more to come. Nisha, one more quickly, maybe 30 seconds uh, as a teaser. And I think there was a question around how do we think... Uh, you know, this is being used in user experience research and design. I know you addressed this a little bit, but do you see some specific things within that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some specific things, yes. So there are some organizations, some specific user experience research companies which have been operating for about 10 to 20 years now and have a lot of uh, user data accumulated uh, across a number of years, A. B, they have consent from each of the users that they have collected data from. So now, interestingly, what they are doing is they are trying to build their own generative AI solutions wherein they are using the data that they, have, that they already have consent for so that for each of the subsequent projects, they do not have to recruit the users every now and then and start research from scratch, but they can use their own in-house generative AI models in order to predict user behavior and then do some additional user research in order to test some of those outcomes. Um, that's some specific use case that we are seeing in the user research field. Perfect. Uh, I, and I think with that, we'll have to call it a day. Uh, I know there were a bunch of other questions we couldn't get to, so our teams will try our best um, uh, to reach out. Uh, you know, I hope you were able to take advantage of our offer to get some of our research uh, delivered straight to you. Uh, but with this, I'll hand it back to our host. Uh, thanks a lot for your time and interaction today.